1 Corinthians chapter 11 is our text. We've been talking about in the last couple of weeks the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Uh, again, I want to remind you, I don't think that I'm doing an injustice to Scripture. Uh, it, this, the principles that we can learn from the Lord's Supper are also principles that we can learn in worship. And I think that one of the principles that we need to learn is that when we come to God's house, this is a special time. Amen? Special time. Not, Sunday, not only Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, whatever opportunity we have is a special time. And I can't help but believe that if we really believed it was special, we would prepare for it. You really get out of what you, get in, what you put into it, right? If you come on a Wednesday night or if you come on a Sunday morning with a heart prepared to worship, with a desire to worship, then you're going to have a worship experience. But if you come just to let someone see you or to keep the preacher or the deacon or Sunday school teacher off your back, then you're probably not going to have a meaningful time of worship. God wants us to prepare. If there's, any, if there's ever a time that we should prepare, according to Scripture, it should be in the, in the obs observation of the Lord's Supper. Um, tells us that we need to come and we need to take it in a worthy manner. We, we've looked at some things about the Lord's Supper. We, we looked at some ideas and thoughts that the Scripture brings out in, in, in beginning in verse 7, uh, 11 through verse 26. And then tonight we looked, we looked last week at the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Tonight I want us to begin to look in verse 27 at the judgment. Now, I know it's none of you. I know it's none of you. But we're living in a day in which, really I want to say the average Christian, excuse me, the average church attender does not see God as a God of judgment. He's a God of mercy, God of love, God of compassion. And he is a God of mercy, God of love, and God of compassion. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that? But by very nature of him being a God of love and mercy and compassion, a God of holiness, then he's got to be a God of judgment. Doesn't make him a bad God, but if he's holy, and he is, then a holy person can't stand unrighteousness. And that doesn't mean that he's mad at you, but he's mad at the unrighteousness. And if there's ever a time that we come to God's house we need to be clean. It needs to be when we come to observe the Lord's Supper. Notice what he says in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I believe that many times people misinterpret particularly the word worthy. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I can't partake of the Lord's Supper because I'm not worthy. Well, the truth of the matter is none of us are. We do not partake of the Lord's Supper because we're worthy. We partake of the Lord's Supper because He's worthy. Same principle in worship. We don't come to worship because we're worthy. We come to worship because He's worthy. May not understand the significance of baptism, but you don't be ba you're not baptized because you're worthy to be baptized, but you're you're baptized because he's worthy to be baptized you're, for your for your obedience. So so it's, it has nothing to do with our worth. It has something to do with his worth. His his worth, and in this text that we've read in verses twenty seven through thirty, there seems to be a severe consequence or chastising for those who partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, in an nonchalant type way. Well, it's just the Lord's Supper. I, 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 I can't overemphasize that too much because just the Lord's Supper is just something that Christ has commanded us to observe. What, what does it mean to partake of the Lord's Supper unworthy? Paul is speaking directly to the Corinthians, but as he speaks to the Corinthians, he's speaking to us here in B.B. Arkansas as well. And whatever sins were bound 
uh, in, in Paul's day as unworthy and were deemed as unworthy in Paul's day, the, the, the sins that the Corinthians were committing were in reality the very same things that we're doing today. Society has not changed. I mean, we've changed. Logan was sharing with Margaret and I this morning. He said, you know, one of the things that makes me feel bad about this day, 9-11, he says, it, it doesn't really mean as much to me as I see it meaning to others. He said, I just, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not unpatriotic. I'm not feeling bad, but it, it just don't seem like I hear people talking about in a, in a patriotic and a, and a remembering type way and a, and a uh, almost a holy type way, but it, I, I don't see it that way. And I spoke up and I said, well, Logan, you were only about eight or ten when that happened. And you really don't mean a whole lot. I mean, every one of you that are here, most every one of you that are here, can, can remember where you were and what you're doing, maybe what you're wearing. You remember those things, and because you were there, it, it made an impact on your life. Not, not only there, but also, I, I told him, I said, I, I remember the day John F., John F. Kennedy got shot. Now, I was younger, don't remember as much about that, but it seems as almost as, as if there was a holy hush over the entire nation, our president got shot. One of the things that burdens me today is if our president were to get shot, there'd be some people rejoice. Now listen to me. You listen closely. I don't care who it is as president. He's the president of our country. If I like him or dislike him, he's the president of our country, and he should be protected. And I don't want anybody killing someone that's giving, giving guidance to our country. And that's, that's just free tonight. We, we think about those things that are meaningful to us. And if 9-11 or the assassination of a president, or I, I remember the jubilation, particularly I remember the jubilation of the American people when the astronauts finally made it back to Earth from the moon. I mean, it was, a, it was a jubilant time when they landed on the moon, but when they made it back, I mean, it was almost all of America was dancing in the streets. I, I mean, we accomplished something great. We sent a man to the moon and we got him back. Isn't that something great? Isn't that something to rejoice about? Let me tell you something greater to rejoice about. God came to earth and he sent his son. He came himself to earth to die that you and I might go to heaven one day. I, I was listening this past week to some old-fashioned southern gospel music and one of the songs I had not heard in years that really ministered to me I bet you I listened to it the past two days 25 30 times it talks about where to look for me when you go to heaven and I'm in heaven don't look for me on the streets of gold. Don't look, don't look, don't, don't look for me around the gates of pearl. Don't, don't look for me uh, in, 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 in the walls of Jasper, but look for me at the feet of Jesus. He's the one that's worthy. So, so, so that's the reason we partake. That's the reason we observe. But in that day, some 2,000 years ago, sin had crept into the church. Tell you what, if it was true back then, how much, how much more real it is today? In fact, it, it seems like it's even more real today. Because I, I never imagined, I never imagined 40 years ago plus when I started the ministry, I never imagined that people in the church would be doing things that they're doing today. And justifying it. Saying there's nothing wrong with it. I'm, am, I'm amazed at the amount of people who live together. See, nothing wrong with it. I'm amazed at the amount of people who, who do, do all of these things and say that you can't justify that in Scripture in, in, in our particular context that we find here. Let, let me just list in verse 18 that the, 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 the Corinthians had a spirit of division. And in, in verse 19, there was a spirit of heresy. Can, could you imagine that? Not very many days after Christ had lived on the earth and given his life and resurrected from the dead, there were already people departing from the truth. I'm telling you today, it is rampant. It's 
fit being fulfilled right before our eyes. In the last day, there'll be a great falling away. I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I don't know if you read about things like this as I do and some of the theological circles, but I'm amazed at the, the, at the amount of people, supposedly theologians, that are coming out today and saying, well, hell, hell is not a real place. Hell is what we experience on earth. What we experience on earth is nothing compared to the severe judgment that God will have on sin because God is a God of holiness. Heresy. Verse 20 talks about self-deception. The worst kind of lying is when you lie to yourself. You ever do that? Don't be careful. Because sometimes we've lied to ourselves so long that we believe our lies. And, and we've convinced ourselves that we really are better than what we really are. And, and we're all selfish by nature. It's not just the pagan guy out here on the street that's, that's doing all the things that we frown upon and look down upon. But it's you and I in the pew of the Baptist church. We've deceived ourselves think, thinking as some of the teenagers who say, you're all that in a bag of chips. We deceive ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. They, in verse 21, they were selfish. They were indulgent. There was the spirit of verse 21 of drunkenness. Verse 21, there was a spirit of neglecting the poor. Verse 22, there was an irreverence and carelessness in protecting the sanctity of the church. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, Brother Bob, this is just a building. And I understand what you're saying about this is just a building, but this is just God's building. I, 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 I want to I remind you of January the 22nd, 1999, for those who say it was just a church, just a building. Do you remember that gut-wrenching feeling when you pulled up and saw the place that you'd been worshiping totally gone? It's just a building. It's just gone. Yes, it's just a building. But this is God's building. And we've, we've allowed, we do things, and here as believers, we do things that, 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 have, that are bringing disrespect to the very house of God. There was a spirit of unthoughtfulness and carelessness in approaching the Lord's Supper. That they were unthoughtful. All, all we can just come and we, it's, just a, it's just a matter of habit. Now this is one of the things that I struggle as a pastor. as one who really, in, in, a, in a way, I don't want to say call the shots, but really determine when we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. I know we're supposed to do it four times a year. Uh, you know, I, I look at congregation who, do, who, who observe the Lord's Supper every week. And in my mind, I may be wrong. Seems as if if, if you did it weekly, it, almost as if it loses its meaning because it becomes a weekly ritual. I don't, I don't know if four times a year is often enough. I don't know if one time a month, a month is often enough. But this, is, I know, this, I know, this I know, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of what Jesus Christ has brought done to bring about an eternal salvation for our hearts and our souls. Very frankly, the things that I, just list, list, that I just listed indicated that the Corinthians had sin in their heart. And God was saying, I'm not going to bless you as long as you have sin in your heart. Can you grip that, church? Can we grip it? Can just this small group that is here tonight grip it? God's not going to bless a church unless that church is pure. Unless we, and, 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 and a church is not going to be pure unless we deal with things in our own hearts and lives. I know in the past couple of weeks, I've had to deal with a lot of things, a lot of prideful thoughts that I've had to deal with. I've had to come and place them under the blood of Jesus. Aren't you thankful when you place them under the blood of Jesus? He is faithful and true to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In order for them to be right, there must be a time of repentance and confession. It's the reason he mentions in our text that there must be a time in which you have a self-examination. 
I, I, how I wish, how I long for. Maybe we need to, maybe I need to preach on this and prepare us more on this. How I long for to have a Sunday that when we come, we come to church for one reason. Our hearts are prepared. We prayed up. We read up in the scripture. We've confessed our sin as much as we know how. And we come in for one purpose, and that's to bring praise and honor and glory to the name of Jesus. I uh, went to the uh, board of directors for the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home in Harrison this past Monday and Tuesday. One of the fellows, we always have a devotion. We had a gentleman come in and did a devotion, and he, he, uh, I, the devotion, maybe, maybe God just inspired him to write it just for me. I can't help but believe it for all of us. You know, oftentimes we say in the children's home, well, it's, it's about the kids. It's about the kids. We got we to care for the kids. There got to be someone who cares for the kids. It's unbelievable. I'm telling you what, it's unbelievable some of the things that God is doing in the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home for the kids. But it's not about the kids. His lesson, his, his Bible study from John chapter 21 was not about Jesus, do you love me? It was what we do is, is about our love for Jesus. You know, we, 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 we volunteer at the Option Pregnancy Center to, to be a receptionist, not because they need a receptionist, but because we love Jesus and he's told us to do so. We volunteer at the children's home. Uh, go to Nebraska. What, what are we doing teaching in Sunday school? Well, you know, Brother Bobby, if you can't get anybody else, I'll teach. No, we, we do it because we love Jesus with all of our hearts and soul and mind and strength. This is what he's called us to do. So when we, when we come to worship, are, 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 you, are you picking up what I'm putting down? When we come to worship, we come for, for an audience of one. Not that Chuck likes the way I sing or anybody else likes the way I sing, but I'm not here to sing to them. I'm here to sing to him. Now I realize for those professional singers you want us to be on note and key and tune and do the bars or whatever the terminology is you know and I, I want to do that I, I, I'm convinced that when I get to heaven I'm going to enjoy heaven far better than the average person because I can't sing now I want to be a part of a choir in heaven I can't hardly wait uh, I heard Papa Sam say this he said when I get to heaven there's going to be a, a thousand baritones over here and there's going to be a thousand sopranos over here and there's going to be a thousand basses over here and there's going to be a thousand something else over here and someone said how about tenor he said I'm going to sing tenor <laughs> that's a little prideful but you know what we all have that good voice in heaven and, and in reality we all have a good voice in the eyes of God when we're singing from the depth of our hearts Margaret will remember we had a girl at Careway. Bless her heart. She loved to sing. She couldn't carry a tune. She was, I mean, even I, the tone deaf, I knew she couldn't sing. But I'm telling you what, when she got through singing, there was not a dry eye in the house. Everybody, even the most hardened person there, when she got through singing, I mean, there was weeping in the house. Because you know why? She is singing it from right here. Years ago, we went to the Southern Baptist Convention, and a guy got up and said, uh, we're fixing to have a special, and this guy called me and said, uh, God laid on my heart to sing a special at the Southern Baptist Convention. He said, I kind of felt like it was my responsibility to make sure the guy could sing, so I called his pastor and said, uh, this guy said that God laid on his heart to sing a special at the Southern Baptist Convention Pastors Conference. Can this guy sing? And the pastor said, not a lick. I mean, he's got the worst voice you ever heard in your life. He said, I'm telling you, it's awful. He said, what do I do? He said, well, this I know. He walks with God, and if he said God told him to sing a special at the Southern Baptist Convention, you better let him because he walks with God. He sang, and boy, the glory of God filled the house. This is what God listens to. This is what God listens to. God listens to a people whose sins are confessed, whose motives are right, whose heart is pure.
Kind of like the 24th Psalm, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? But he, hath, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul up into vanity nor sworn deceitfully. That's what he's not talking about in partaking of the Lord's Supper. And listen what he says when you don't take it seriously. Judgment's going to come. I'd be honest with you, I've struggled with that. I'm thankful that God doesn't send judgment based upon what, how I think he should. Have you ever thought, well, I'll tell you one thing, bless God. If I was God, I'd kill him. Well, if I was God, there'd be not one person alive in this room, including me. You know what I'm saying? Well, aren't you thankful that, that we're not God? Aren't, aren't you thankful that God is long-suffering, compassionate, that God is loving, that God is always there? And aren't you thankful, Margaret showed this to me years ago, I believe it's in the 78th Psalm, aren't you thankful that God remembers that we are but flesh? That God forgives? But he uses those people that hearts are pure, that motives are clean, Sins are confessed. Do I, do I need to remind you? I know I don't. You. The Bible talks about judgment beginning at the house of the Lord. You know, we as Baptists, can, we're good at blaming others. You know what I'm saying? Our problem is a political problem. Our problem is a democratic problem. Our problem is a Republican problem. Our problem is a gay problem. Our, God, our problem is alcohol. Our, God, our problem is drugs. No, that, that's none of our problems. Our problem is right here. And when this house gets right, when this house gets right, are you getting what I'm saying? When this house gets right, there's going to be people out in the community that God's going to touch because our hearts are pure. I was reminded this past week, Preached at First Baptist Church of Lepanto, only about eight miles from where I was raised. And in our youth group in the mid 70s, they had a poster board in the youth Sunday school room on Wednesday nights. And they had all of our names there. And they prayed every Wednesday night for these boys and these girls to be saved. I'm thankful that someone was burdened enough or cared enough to put Bob Hall's name on that list. Because you know what? I was one of those kids. I don't want to glory in my past. I was one of those kids that I, don't, that I, I really didn't want my kids around. You know what I'm saying? I did anything and everything an 18-year-old spoiled, rotten brat could do. But they began to pray. And God began to pick us off because one by one, the church was committed to Christ, committed to following him. And one by one, God began to save our souls and change our lives. And it began with pure hearts, pure, open, pure motives. I said, Bob, you went to church, you started the church because there was pretty girls. Well, I have to admit, there were some pretty girls. I got one of them. In fact, I got the best one of them. And that might have been the motive of some of us that went to church. But their motive was not our looks. But their motive is that we needed Jesus. There's a lot of people in our town that need Jesus. President of our convention, J.D. Greer, I've not received the material yet, but he's come up with a, I don't know if a program or a theme for the fall. And it's just entitled, Who's Your One? Has anybody ever heard of, heard of this new, Who's Your One? And I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't judge on how we're going to do or what we're going to do. I want to be a part of it. But if I understand the premise of it is everybody in the congregation pick out one. One person in your community. One person that you know that's lost. And commit to pray for that one person. Commit to invite that one person. Could you, could you imagine what would it be like three months from now if we made that commitment, we prayed for him, and everybody in the congregation invited one? I forget the percentage of the people who come. It's real, real high that come when someone invites them. They're just waiting on for us to invite them. 
and praying for that one and have the right motive. We wanted them to come. Not that our church would be bigger. Not that our offerings would be bigger. But that they would come to know the Jesus that we know as Lord and Savior of their lives. God says that if you don't partake in a worthy matter, you bring forth damnation to yourself. In fact, if you read this text, it says some, some have, 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 have slept. So some, have, some have fallen asleep. Some have died. The right approach of the Lord's Supper is that we're to judge ourselves. By the way, if we're judging ourselves, we're not going to have time enough to judge others, right? I, I think it's a misnomer. I think it's one of the mis, uh, most, most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible is judge not lest you be judged. When I stand or when you stand and we can take the Bible and we can say, thus saith the Lord, adultery is wrong. We're not judging you. God's already judged you. I've used this illustration. You've heard me say it hundreds of times. When I was a kid, Daddy carried the mail, and they used to deliver chickens from Sears and Roebuck. You know, you'd order, I guess, 100 chickens from Sears and Roebuck. And quite frequently, someone in Dice would get a box of 100 chickens, and Daddy would bring them by, and I'd get to look at them chickens. Sometimes he'd let me go and help them deliver the chickens if they were close. And sometimes if we were close to the family and we were close to a lot of them, we'd, we'd take them to the house and we'd open them up and we'd look in there and i get to see those little chickens all in that box. And if I looked down at those chickens in the box and, and one of them had a, a bill rather than a beak and they had a web foot rather than three toes, if I said, that's a duck, that don't mean I'm judging. A duck's a duck, a chicken's a chicken. I'm saying all that to say this. Judging others is wrong and we should not do that. But if we spend our time judging ourselves, we're not going to have time to judge others. I'd hate to be him come judgment day. Hey, I'm going to hate to be me come judgment day. Secondly, in observing the Lord's Supper, we, we must learn if we do it wrongly, we must accept the chastising of the Lord. We must learn to serve one another, by, by the way. I hear all the time people say, you know, probably the number one question I get in, in ministry is, Preacher, why does bad things happen to good people? Isn't that a pretty good question? Why does bad things happen to good people? One of the greatest theologians that I have ever read is a man by the name of R.C. Sproul. Has anybody ever read any books by R.C. Sproul? He answers that as well as, if not better, than anybody, anybody I've ever heard. Preacher, why does bad things happen to good people? He said, I don't know because I've never met a good person. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. I, and I, I know what we're saying. We, uh, uh, we, we, we're, we're, I, I know what you're saying when you say that. But we, you do understand that life is filled with troubles. And a lot of troubles we have... We bring it on ourselves. You know what I'm saying? If we observe correctly, we don't bring condemnation upon ourselves. We look at this time of worship as every other time of worship. This is time that we've set aside at 11 o'clock, 10.50 on Sunday morning, 6 o'clock on Sunday night, 6 o'clock on Wednesday night. We've come to not necessarily hear from Brother Bob, but to hear from God. And I hope and pray that when we come and open his word, that we do hear a word from him each day and that we're challenged to go out and do what we've learned. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and privilege that you've given us to come to your house today. Pray your word would not fall upon deaf ears. Pray it find a lodging in our hearts.